Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government for our event today. I'm Jill Rutter. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Government and a uh, notorious Aussie file. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that we're partnering today with the NAS Group to bring you a discussion on why Australia style has become the epithet of choice for this government. Whether Australia is indeed the aspirational of epitome of good governance this implies, and whether we're learning the right lessons from our mates down under, or whether we have more to learn from their near neighbour in New Zealand. Or are they just a country that's always been known as the lucky country, has gone on riding its luck, maybe until now? So we're going to discuss politics Australia style, what uh, we in the UK should be learning, and whether actually those Aussies are interested in learning anything from us. To do that, I'm joined uh, by a brilliant cross-planetary cross panel made possible by uh, the wonders of online events before Freedom Day narrows our horizons again to just who can make it into the room in uh, SW1. So I am joined in no particular order by Laura Tingle, a journalist and chief political correspondent at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and those of us who did Brexit broadcasting for the last few years know that actually the place that always did the best interviews on Brexit was not the BBC, it was the ABC. Uh, it's great to be joined by Laura. And then also in Sydney, but a bit of a British export, is Mark Steers, director of the Sydney Policy Lab at Sydney University and former chief speechwriter to the Labour Party. So those are our two uh, Australian representatives in Canberra and Sydney respectively, but back home I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by two other Brits, uh, James Starkey. James is founding partner at 5654 and Company and a former Chief of Staff to our Home Secretary Priti Patel and you'll all remember that of course the UK's new uh, immigration regime has been dubbed an Australian style system. Uh, so welcome James. And last but not least, the IFG's very own John McTurnan, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government, but more relevantly today, former Director of Political Operations for Tony Blair and Director of Communications for Julia Gillard, Australia's uh, first woman Prime Minister and indeed the only ever Prime Minister born in Wales. So those are our cast list today. We're going to get stuck in. But first of all, a bit of housekeeping. We've got the Q&A function. Please post your questions there, type them in. But actually, if you see somebody asking a question that you'd really like to have asked, they won't have put it as well as you, of course, but just do upvote them. And please don't write your essay on comparative political analysis there because it makes it impossible to read. So short and snappy makes it much more likely a question will be asked. If you can add your name and where you're joining us from, please do that. And if you're from Australia, I'll operate a bit of uh, post-imperial preference there. We'll be live tweeting from our IFG events account. Please use the hashtag IFG Oz, A-U-S, not O-Z. Please follow and tweet along. Video and sound recording available within 24 hours. Tell all your friends. But first of all, before we get stuck into our panel, I would like to thank NAUS for their support in staging this event and just ask Peter Horn, Principal at NAUS Group, to make a few introductory remarks. Peter. Thank you, Jill. Uh, NAUS are absolutely delighted to be able to support this event and particularly an issue that matters so much at both, both in the UK and around the world. I think the UK has a habit of doing very little in the way of experimentation on a geographic basis with its policy. Uh, and for those of us with long enough memories, um, going back to the poll tax, I uh, can sort of see why uh, any political advisor advising their minister to go for that might be seen as, as braver than otherwise. And even perhaps some of the consequences of the poll tax ex experiment uh, that we might see around devolution we're, we're still at a stage in the UK that it may be the case that different policy ideas and, and, and great examples are developed in different parts of the UK, uh, but the political politics of it holds people back from what I used to describe in, a, in another life as dealing with pride from other organisations. And yet the UK can and does look internationally, and in particular within Australia, uh, it seems that there's right, right, it's ripe to have 
a level of experimentation, particularly between the different states, uh, which leads to both a, a certain level around policy competition, uh, but also the ability to spot that when something's been done better over there, uh, you might as well copy it pretty quickly. And, and the UK can take that in. Now, NAUS cares about this for, for two reasons. First of all, we, we have roots in Australia, Canada, the UK, and over the past 20 years, we've seen institutions and jurisdictions learn from each other, and we want to continue that process. And more recently, and perhaps almost more presently, uh, as we come out, as we emerge from the COVID lockdown in the UK, uh, we've had clients repeatedly ask us uh, to understand both the social and economic experience of what's gone on in Australia, as Australia has had a, di a very different experience of COVID lockdown and COVID implications to the UK. So really excited to hear the conversation today. Back to you, Jill. Thank you very much, Peter. That's uh... That's a really good intro there. I'm slightly worried about these poll tax references. Um, so I did actually work on that and I actually watched the poll tax riots from a hotel room in Perth, Australia and couldn't work out what country these riots were happening in. And then I saw a London bus and realised it was Trafalgar Square. Anyway, but we will put our poll tax memories aside and let's come right up to the present. I want to start with you first, James. Um, you work with Priti Patel. It's been a big selling point for the government to dub policies, whether it's the new migration regime or indeed no trade deal with the uh, EU, as being Australia style. Does this really reflect some sort of deep learning from Australia or is it actually just that Australia appears to be um, good branding? Because when we think of Australia, we remember in a certain generation, Skippy, uh, maybe more recent generations, Kylie Minogue or Neighbours and things like that. Is there more to it than a bit of positive branding? Thank you. I, uh, it's funny. I mean, this has really made me think a lot over the last couple of weeks since you kindly invited me to, to take part in this panel. Uh, I'm very aware there's a lot of people here who are expert on the Australia side. So I, I hopefully can talk a little bit to the kind of UK political side. I think that when you look at, let's take particularly the immigration system to start with, in a way it's it's by accident and then it there's also a real reason behind it. It's by accident because if you think back, I think I'm right in saying that the Australian point system was really first floated by Farage uh, quite a few years ago and then it kind of was seen to be popular and as a way of branding. I, I also think, having sat in the Home Office and worked on the current uh, immigration bill, that there are lessons to be learned. But it's the case that Japan and Canada have quite similar immigration systems. They're called different things, but broadly they do the same thing. And so I think that UK politics has somehow alighted on something almost by accident, but has tapped into the way the British public see Australia, which, as you rightly said, Jill, like uh, kind of brings certain things to mind which are just broadly positive. That's very interesting. Um, I, I'm just sort of just when we stick on this, I mean, we see very strong links between the Conservative Party and their Australian election gurus, people like Lyndon Crosby, Isaac Levido in number 10. I mean, is there a really sort of fertile exchange of ideas? We've seen Tony Abbott being appointed to the Board of Trade to advise Liz Truss. Is there a very fertile exchange of ideas on the sort of right of British politics with the Australian Liberal Party? I mean, again, I think to an extent that's come to degree by by accident. Um, you know, Linton was obviously involved. I don't, I don't know him personally, but we, I think we all know he was involved with kind of Boris election campaigns going back for quite a long time since his first mayoral campaign, which would have been in 2008. Um, and then I, you know, Isaac kind of worked for Linton and came to know it that way. So, but I think there has become this kind of connection because you did see, you know, the government were prepared to risk quite a row for Tony Abbott to be to be involved in that uh, trade role. And so there has been this kind of connection, and, uh, and we may discuss it later. Later, but you, but as you said, Jill, we kind of took it upon the government took it upon themselves to call what was in effect no deal, to call it an Australian style deal, because I mean, fundamentally I think they thought that would be more palatable to the public. So I, I think it, it's by accident, but there's some reason behind it because it's the way the UK public see Australia, Australia and Australian politics to the extent they know it. I want to come to Laura, but first of all, John McTernan has just 
drop me a line to say actually Australian style is trademarked Tony Blair, not the Conservative John. What was the attraction for Tony Blair? When did he, what context did he use it in? Look, I think it's the, uh, Tony himself, uh, like most people in the Labour Party, got long connections to Australia. And it was the it was the Australian style points based system that he talked about in his election for his third term. And that's because that seems uh, like a framing which is firm but fair. Um, it's one that uh, appeals to the public and that's immigration was a major uh, battleground of the 2005 election. Uh, and Blair took uh, a lot of criticism from Michael Howard, but finally came back with a major speech on uh, immigration, which basically drew the line between the Tories going too far and Labour having a fair based system. So I think there is a, 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 a not everybody in UK politics would actually associate Australia with the fair go, but I think fair go mateship, the kind of broad framing of Australian politics is one that the elites know because of the trade back and forth on both sides, Labour and Tory, uh, it has been significant for decades, not simply for the last decade. Really interesting. Laura, I wanted to come to you. Um, so we don't get that much Australian reporting. We you know, hear about Ash Barty winning Wimbledon, uh, Australian cricket team, uh, whether doing well or perhaps uh, not so well. Um, but we don't really know what's going on in Australian politics. So is Australia this sort of well-governed paradigm? Peter was mentioning some of the sort of, you know, learning from federalism and things like that. But, you know, how does, how does governance feel like in Australia? Uh, it actually feels pretty woeful, Jill, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, look, I think there are a couple of things that I can contribute here um, without you know, confessing that I don't know a lot about the current um, migration debate in the UK. One of them is that I think uh, the experience of the last 10 years in particular uh, has been a decline in the quality of our governance, uh, in the decline in the quality of the transparency and accountability of government, um, the rise of the spectre of corruption at the federal level. Uh, uh, and we've got sort of this extraordinary thing going on at the moment uh, where we've had this gradual increase of money put into slush funds for election campaigns and repeatedly uh, audit office findings that the money was not distributed according to guidelines, uh, and then most recently, we've had a scheme uh, which was for commuter car parks, which it turns out didn't have any guidelines at all. Uh, and when this was uncovered, the re response of the federal government was, well, yeah, so what? So I think on one level, in a sort of uh, accountability sense, uh, the government governance has gone downhill spectacularly and alarmingly. Uh, on another level, on policy, there's sort of interesting things going on. We don't have policy debates, I don't think, as we did even 20 years ago or even 10 years ago in uh, across the partisan divide. Most of the big issues now are completely sort of uh, frozen. Uh, climate change being a classic example, we're not getting anywhere with those. Uh, the brawls within the major p political parties uh, sort of stopped in any forward movement. Um, but What's happened with COVID, and you made a reference to this uh, before, is that certainly in the early stages of the crisis, uh, there was this uh, move to have a, a national cabinet, that is the federal, cap federal government plus all the state governments actually meeting and sort of working out policy jointly, which sounded really good. But a lot of people went, oh, that's terrible because, you know, nobody will ever have a, have a uh, view and the, the states will get too involved and everything. My view of it was, well, actually, when things are so complicated, it's actually good to have policy in contention so that you do have this visible uh, sort of conflict, if you like, of ideas or contest of ideas, uh, which I think has been very important uh, at crucial points of this um, in our dealing with it. For example, uh, it was a couple of the states who really pushed Scott Morrison uh, to lock down Australia. Now, some people might, might not have liked that, but it ended up being a very successful thing in keeping COVID under control. Uh, and at the same time, there was this division of responsibilities between uh, income support at the federal government level and quarantine and vaccine at the state level. Now, it's fallen to pieces a bit since, quite spectacularly, but 
I suppose they're just a couple of themes that I'd sort of raise, which may be of interest to you. So has that um, devolved, has that sort of arrangement between the national government and the federal government actually kept going? Because we've had a bit of a sort of breakdown over in the UK. I mean, clearly, in a sense, it's easier in Australia because you don't have an Australian state being run by a party committed to secede from Australia, at least I don't think you do. Um, it's in Australia, but that's that's a bit different. Yeah, but uh, but has that arrangement kept going? Because here we we did have sort of a degree of cooperation until about last May, and then it seemed to break down, uh, not least because I think there was a bit of a feeling that it was becoming too political and that the devolved leaders would just go out and sort of, you know, maybe Trump government announcements by going a bit first and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, well, certainly um, it has broken down. Uh, partly, I think, um, you know, because Victoria uh, suffered early the, the worst of the outbreaks, so it became a bit fashionable for uh, the federal government to basically say, well, you know, brackets, you know, it's all very sort of a sort of nudging and winking, but, you know, Victoria is hopeless. Now, there was lots of things in Victoria that were hopeless, but Victoria is hopeless. Everybody else is great. Uh, brackets, you know, you know, we we would all be in a good place if it wasn't for the Victorian government, which just happens to be a Labor government, so on the other side of politics. Uh, so that sort of re didn't really help. But what has also complicated things is that, uh, ironically, the two things that the federal government should really be responsible for are quarantine and vaccine. Uh, quarantine is the only health power in the Australian Constitution given to the federal government. Everything else is supposed to be done by the states. Um, and of course, border border control, as we often hear, is as uh, the federal government's territory, um, and it and the federal government thought it could win big time by um, doing the vaccine rollout, which in fact was something that the states had traditionally done. That's the thing that's really gone pear shaped, uh, and so there's a lot of blame shifting being attempted between both sides, but both levels of government about that as well. So it's not been all that attractive and it's not none of it's really been resolved about what we do do about quarantine in the long term uh, and vaccine we're sort of gradually fixing up but it's uh, it's not you know it's nowhere near where it should be given what a head start we had we're now behind so many countries including the UK. Um, we've discussed a bit you said we were Australia's behind the UK is there any sort of attempt in Australia does it cut through at all to say actually we need to learn a lesson from the UK on how they did the vaccine rollout do Australian politicians look over and try and sell things as doing things UK style or is that an absolute political no-go area even if you were absolutely cloning a UK program well, I think everybody looks at the UK and even the US and says, well, they did it. Um, and particularly, you know, the, the US rather unique style of um, you know, being able to get vaccinated at the kids' soccer game or whatever. But I suppose there's not, um, unfortunately, there, there may be the case in the UK that our media debate is not all that sophisticated these days. Um, you know, my inclination would be to presume that, you know, the NHS, uh, whatever else has happened is, you know, the backbone of how the vaccine, uh, vaccine program has worked so successfully. And we don't really look at those systemic differences between systems to sort of say, well, you know, what did the U how did the UK roll this out so much more effectively than we do? There's not a lot of that comparative work done, you know, by journalists on either side of the, of the world looking at these things in any great detail and saying, well, why did it work so much better in the UK? We tend to just look at the politics of it. Very interesting, very interesting. Mark, um, you've been sitting over there, but you actually look across both systems. I'm just sort of intrigued from your position in the Sydney Policy Lab, whether you look at things that have been done in Australia and say, actually, that's the thing the UK really should be thinking about doing a bit more like Australia. I remember there was an article a couple of years ago in The Economist suggesting that actually Australia had avoided the sort of crisis of healthcare funding by taking action early to bring in a sort of, you know, more insurance based model for some people. Uh, Australian superannuation scheme. We know that the UK's tuition fees proposal 
look quite similar to the Australian Higher Education Contribution Scheme. Uh, do you look around and think actually the lessons they really should be learning are X, Y and Z in the policy lab? No is the short answer, um, but it's a slightly more complicated answer than that, really. Um, when I first arrived in Australia, which was probably four and a bit years ago, uh, and looked around at how, how policy is made, what policy is being generated, I mean, the first thing, as, as Laura has already said, is just how stark the difference is with the UK. So the policy making ecosystem that you still have in London is non-existent in Australia. There, there are tiny think tanks. Uh, there are very few policy institutes at the big universities. We're one of the very few, and I, I only have a team of five or six you know, people. Um, uh, there is, simply isn't a tradition of the opposition parties, for example, investing large amounts of money in policy formulation. So if you're in the New South Wales um, Parliament as a you know, sort of opposition front bencher, you, you don't have a team. You might have somebody to help you with your press release, but you have nobody to conduct policy work with you. So it's a much thinner policy ecosystem than the British system is. But it does have two very interesting characteristics. Um, which do, I think, you know, intrigue British politicians and policymakers. I mean, the first one is that many areas of policy are, in fact, just left to public servants or to technocrats in a way that they never would be in the UK. So, you know, you can find really interesting ideas, for example, in education and in healthcare, especially at the state level, are buried away in the public service not held up to any scrutiny or account, you know, overlooked by ministers, shadow ministers, never debated in the papers, but actually full of interest and some sort of very, you know, sort of very serious people proceeding to investigate, you know, very complex problems in, in intelligent and interesting ways. They're just not the stuff of politics, they're the stuff of day-to-day -day administration, if you like. Um, and that's, again, from my time in London, uh, you know, I used to talk a lot to Sadiq Khan's team when I was running New Economics Foundation, and almost every single area of policy that the London Assembly would be thinking of could be an evening standard front page the next day. In, in Sydney, here in New South Wales, it's just not like that. Public servants can get on with the business of finding things out and putting things into practice almost without any political debate. Then, though, on the other side, there are the big political issues, the things which are on the front pages or on the ABC. Um, and they are kind of they have a clarity to them, if I may put it that way, that, again, the British debate doesn't have. And that, I think, is because of the nature of Australian politics, which is um, compulsory voting, three year parliaments and an alternative vote system, which means that third parties, fourth parties aren't actually that important which means that the big parties, the ALP, the Labour Party and the Liberals, know what the centre ground of Australian politics is. They can focus group it to death. They can poll it to death. That's why Crosby and co are so good, because they know who's going to be voting, what issues they're going to be voting on and what messages resonate. And again, in the UK context, you never have that clarity because you're not clear where's Farage going to go. Who's actually going to turn out this time? Do I have to play to the base or should I pitch to the middle? There's a, such a range of complexities to UK politics, which don't exist here in Australia. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a paradox, which is that we here in Australia, in some sense, we have a much thinner system or a thinner ecosystem than you have in the UK. But actually, that does leave these two interesting spaces for innovation, one buried deep in the public service and the other in the focus groups, in the opinion polls, that the big two parties can run knowing what the issues are going to be, knowing what the terrain of an election uh, is going to look like. That's really interesting. John, you were working for Julia Gillard in uh, when she was prime minister. Uh, did it seem like that to you that, I mean, should we be actually rather looking at some of these uh, Australian constitutional innovations, whether it's alternative vote, uh, obviously rejected in the 2011 or was it 2012 referendum back in the UK, um, three year elections, which always struck us as a bit of a nightmare, I think, for getting anything done in the UK. Uh, compulsory voting. Uh, we all love stories of the Australian sausage sizzle around elections. I mean, is Australian politics very different from the UK? Does it have a different feel because of all those features? Oh, John seems to have just disappeared. Oh, John has frozen, so... Oh, no. Mark, quickly, do you think it feels very different in Australia to the politics you knew back in the UK? Yeah, I think there's, there's no doubt. The biggest difference I think all of those constitutional innovations create that you just mentioned 
uh, is that it generates a, a pitch for the middle, which we've not seen in recent years in the UK. It, it, you know, recent years in the UK, there's been a plausible argument that both parties need to pitch for the extreme. You know, Jeremy Corbyn tried that, uh, you know, without success, but Boris tried it with much more success to build a sort of Brexit block um, for the Conservative Party. It's very, very difficult to run a major political campaign like that in Australia. You're always looking to the centre ground because compulsory voting uh, and AV just drag you into that terrain. Not on every single issue, as Laura's indicated, um, but nonetheless, overall, uh, this this is this is a government you know which is constantly polling, uh, and as a result, you know, is tacking close to the centre of Australian electoral politics. So um, I've got a question here, Laura, um, from Ian Scott, uh, and I know this echoes some work that the Grattan Institute, John Daly, has been doing about, you know, back in the 80s, we had quite a reforming right wing government, conservative government in the UK and Australia. I remember writing speeches where we were always pointing to Hawke Keating for UK government ministers or David Longy and uh, Roger Douglas over in New Zealand. Do you get the sense that the sort of you know, reforming impetus, all that sort of policy innovation we saw back in the 80s that actually that's just gone and Australia's a bit stuck now when it comes to tackling, tackling big challenges. Or is it actually just, just sort of OK enough that it can just coast by and leave everybody to get on with life and go to the beach? Well, I think there are a few things happening. Um, I think that uh, it's if you start to think about New Zealand as well, they're actually completely different things happening in terms of, well, if I, if I just go back to a point that Mark was making, if you think about uh, the dynamics of the, the political and policy debates, um, what I would argue has happened in Australia is that the sort of public service uh, impetus and that sort of rich uh, sort of uh, world of ideas has basically gone completely into decline in the last 20 years and been replaced by opinion polling um, and uh, and Scott Morrison as we as he's known Scotty from marketing doesn't doesn't do anything unless he's poll tested it uh, you know and that's that's not sort of a sort of a that's just what happens so um, if we look back at the 80s and 90s though um, we had two things happening we we had reforming governments in Australia and New Zealand but the way they reformed were sort of completely opposite to each other in a way even though both were Labor governments and subsequently the coalition governments. Uh, the Australian uh, reform experience was one based on having a quite public debate, uh, winning the argument for change, um, you know, moderating what you were doing uh, as, as people sort of made protests about what the impact would be, but getting a lot of change through the system as a result. Um, now, New Zealand, by comparison, and you can argue that that's partly because it didn't have states and you know only had uh, one chamber of parliament um, and uh, a different electoral system, all those things. Um, basically, all of these changes were rammed through by governments that never said before they were elected that that was what. I think Laura's frozen now in not a testament to Canberra broadband. Uh, let's go to let's go to John while we try and get Laura back. John, just the. Just does the sort of bite of electoral politics feel different in Australia? I mean, we've always talked about these three year electoral cycles in Australia. Does that mean you feel compared to the sort of four or five years you had four years under Tony Blair that you feel you've got to get things done much quicker in Australia? Or do you basically just assume you'll come back after the first three years and uh, and you've actually got six years, five, six years to work with? Australia is like the UK, which is there are very rarely one term governments. So if you win one election, you're likely to win the next one. So you can always have that four to five year horizon uh, for executing policy. Um, when you're inside it, three year parliaments and 17 week sitting uh, years don't feel that short. They feel very intense. Um, so the politics in that sense, um, it, it may have different endpoints in the cycle, but it actually doesn't uh, feel any less intense. I think the um, I think you raised at the beginning about Australia being the lucky country. Um, one of the things that you you feel in Australia, you feel outside Australia is uh, 
there's a huge demand, and Laura was talking about it, a huge demand really for governments that take on huge reform. Uh, and to, to a great extent, the current debate in uh, Australia is rent seekers organised in peak bodies asking for the government to, um, to either protect their peak body or to give them uh, additional rents. Um, so the, so the reform has become a dirty word correctly because reform is mainly for rent seeking. There are, of course, huge frozen issues in, in Australian politics, as, as Laura pointed out, the biggest of which is um, climate change. Nobody sensible in the UK would wish to adopt the Austra an Australian style net zero approach. Um, and Boris has no intention of even using the phrase Australian style to address our approach to COP26. Uh, and that is in a sense because another strand in Australian politics uh, is, I think, I, I disagree with Mark to a tiny bit. Um, the two blocks of, uh, of parties are, do face massive challenge from third parties and fourth parties, smaller parties, who get represented in the Senate, who control a, a blocking interest in the Senate, uh, which is important for politics. But also, um, between a quarter and a third of all Australians have actually voted for another par party other than the two main parties uh, over the last decades. So there's more fluidity, but there has been the populist strain in Australian politics, which is that, in a sense, Trumpism came to Australia early through the issue of climate change, and Australia's never, never been able to politically move that issue on, which is a huge challenge given that Australia is, is one of the parts of the global north which could be made uninhabitable by uh, climate change. Um, so that it's almost like the, you know, there's a body, of, there's a group of people, peak bodies seeking uh, reform, which wouldn't be really reform, and there's a massive required reform for the country which is frozen politically and, uh, you know, to, to the point that a government minister can bring a lump of coal into parliament and hold it up as if burning coal uh, is not a giant problem in Australia, China, India, across the globe. So it is it is that kind of, that sometimes it feels that Australian politics doesn't address the gigantic issue. I do feel, uh, I think Laura and Mark both talked about it, the drumbeat of opinion polling is a drumbeat in the media. And that's coming to, I mean, that's come to Britain. Part of the way in which every issue in Britain is now refracted is through what's the polling say. That used to not be a thing in the UK politics. It was a big thing when I was in Australia, the, 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 the fortnightly news poll, that coming out. Um, and that sense that, po I mean, opinion polling is pointless for politicians because it tells you about the past, not the future. And most politicians should be trying to create a future and step people from the positions they hold at the moment into one where they can support the changes that are required for the country. That, but that failure of leadership um, is kind of, until Biden came along, it was a kind of global failure. It's there in Germany with Merkel, it's there in, uh, it's there in most European countries, it was there in America under Trump. The failure of political leadership is a global political class problem, uh, and it's not solved by having different media, it's not solved by having different political parties, not solved by having think tanks. It, there is something going on in our politics, which is that globally the challenges are so large that the political structures that emerged from the late 19th century into the early 20th century, whether they are civil servants or whether it's the political party formations, don't seem to fit the challenge. That's quite interesting. He's got a comment here from Ben Wellings from Monash, who's talking about the effect of polling on uh, on the type of leadership uh, and maybe uh, a reluctant, um, I don't know, we've seen sort of one of the things that we're very interested in in the UK, I don't know, James, whether British politicians look at this and askance, uh, is the readiness with which uh, Australians change their prime ministers and things like that. Um, I'm going to come to Laura about the effect of that on, uh, on policy making in Australia, whether the threat from the caucus is a big chilling effect on uh, on leaders, maybe under you know, Kevin Rudd, Peter Gillard, Malcolm Turnbull, etc. Tony Abbott. Um, does the, but James, just a question first. Does the, do the Conservative politicians actually have good relationships? You talked about Scott Morrison as being a sort of bit of a light character. Um, is that going to show up in anything concrete? Uh, you know, John's mentioned climate as the big area where Australia almost stands in the way of a Boris Johnson success in Glasgow. You know. Will he actually be able to use this leverage with Australia at all? Does he have any lever perceived to have any leverage? I mean, I don't know. Jo John would probably know better than me in terms of what's going on there, or or, or Laura, or even Mark. I think 
Um, but it is a really good example that John cites that there are like why will why will look at countries and say, you know, in this case, Australia, they when we look on immigration, there's a strong feeling that you broadly look at Australia and think, well, they seem to have quite a lot of control. We hear a lot of talk about Australia brings in people that it needs nurses. We hear our nurses go over there quite a lot. That seems like a good thing. We're in a, I think, uh, also having worked in DEFRA, uh, we're in a totally different space in terms of the environment. And they, those things would just not be palatable domestically. And I think John makes a really interesting point because also, while we might broadly look at certain countries and say they've got it good in this way, they're good in this way, we will also look and say, well, we're not quite sure that way because when we talk about immigration broadly, if we separate two things out, the kind of immigration bill, but asylum, I personally think some of the things that we would perceive to happen in Australia around asylum would not be acceptable here. And so, and we've seen some, uh, let's say, I would imagine late night briefings off the record about oil rigs and all this kind of stuff, which I imagine was never government policy and completely made up by some kind of special advisor or whatever. But those things immediately you had a government line saying, we're not going to do that. Are you crazy? So that even even when we look at immigration in its broadest terms, we separate those things out. There is something acceptable, the control, what, what people do we need in the country? And there's something we look at even in Australia and say, I'm not quite sure about how they deal with asylum seekers. That's interesting. Interesting. I want to come on to civil service reform. We've got the launch of the Commission for Smarter Government report uh, with Michael Gove. And one of the things it's suggesting is um, a prime minister's department, um, which obviously is a feature of the Australian system, suggesting that permanent secretary become chief executives, which I think is more a feature of the New Zealand system of government. I just wondered, um, Laura, is the Australian public service at the moment in a in a good place? Um, if we were looking at the UK, should we be saying that? We know that I think the Australian public servants are paid quite a lot more than their UK counterparts but you know is that part of the governing system working well should we be looking to Australia there? So what's been happening is uh, several things uh, we did corporatize as they say uh, a lot of our uh, sort of government business enterprises in the 1980s and 1990s uh, somewhere between privatizing and um, keeping them as uh, public service authorities some of that's been fine uh, that left the sort of the core public service as in policy advice work. Uh, and what happened was that uh, particularly under the Hawke and Keating governments, um, we saw the rise of the ministerial advisor uh, so that uh, over time, essentially government departments, you know, from uh, health, education, all those things have been more or less sidelined uh, in terms of their, the power of their advice to ministers, um, except in the sort of in national security space. Uh, but they've all been a bit sidelined by private advisors, advisors in ministers' offices. So um, I think that's uh, not been at all for the good. Uh, we, we, have, um, we don't have permanent tenure, which you know, some people would say is a great thing, uh, but we've seen an increased uh, sacking of public service heads. As far as the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet is concerned, uh, that has always been, contentious is too strong a word, but it was essentially in, uh, introduced during Malcolm Fraser's prime ministership uh, to sort of counter the uh, the power of the Treasury and uh, to sort of provide an overview of all the other departments. It works sometimes better than other times, depending on the prime minister and depending on the strength of other departments at the time. But uh, I think you'd have to say that the public service has been hollowed out. A lot of people have left in despondency. Um, there's a sort of a, you know, there's a tendency now, uh, in fact, for uh, if the public service is asked for advice, that they actually contract out the advice gathering to private sector consultants, not because they necessarily know anything better, but because it's regarded as a sort of a protection for themselves that they get a sort of a private sector consultant uh, who is often sort of uh, better regarded by particularly the conservative parties than the public service itself. So they can say, well, we, we've asked brackets one of your mates to uh, give us a report on this. John, did you think there was a difference in the quality of support? Was the centre stronger in Australia? Some of the things that we hear the government is hoping, you know, this Commission on Smarter Governments 
hoping to achieve. James Forsyth tells us that these are going to be well received in Downing Street, um, which is a leading indicator that they probably are going to be well in received in Downing Street. Do you think, did you get the thing thinking if only we'd had this when I was working for Tony Blair, it could have been so different? The thing that I wanted when I worked for Tony Blair was the Australian factional system uh, inside the parliamentary party, the parliamentary parties, uh, because that means that there are no revolts. There are no backbench revolts. Uh, you can, uh, with a majority of one, you can govern for three years. And that is a real issue. The centre is as powerful as your control over the parliamentary caucus. Um, we don't have, Boris Johnson's problem is not that Downing Street is strong or weak versus Treasury. You will, n nobody in the world has found a way to outthink Treasury because they raise the taxes. Um, and they also are full of clever people who are always clever and the stupid mendicants that come to you from, from service departments. Um, Boris Johnson's problem is his 80 seat majority isn't 80 seats because he because they because they're they're not loyal and they won't lose their seats if they don't vote for him. in Australian politics you don't vote the government line you, your faction removes you uh, and you won't have a parliamentary seat you won't have a career that is incredibly useful so we didn't need a you know you don't need a strong center the prime minister is strong as her control over the caucus which then means the agenda is powerful as the agenda adopted by the prime minister now is that is the support better or worse? Well, the special advisor support is definitely better for, for ministers. I just in comms, I was managing a team of nearly 20, uh, which is not, you know about as large as the entire special advisors were for Tony. Um, so the, the advisor, that's a good thing. Um, and I think Francis Moore tried to bring that over. Uh, I worked with Simone Finn when I was in Australia. Simone came over to look for Francis and what should be. And I said, not the New Zealand model, do the Australian model. Um, the, the the lack of the 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 lack of consent in the country to reform is a combination of who raises the issues, who thinks through the issues, who gets them there. And it, one of the changes that has happened in politics in the last twenty years, UK and Australia, is more ideas come come from uh, advisors than come from uh, departments. But that's true of health reform in the UK. Health ref health reform used to be led in the UK uh, by the health service. Um, it's not been led by the health service for probably 30 years um, and we've probably got a better health service for that actually. So I never got um, the advisor thing I saw because I saw, I saw Laura um, disagreeing with me I think body language certainly. Look the advisor system does prevent you from being uh, in the department so all advisors all ministers are in the parliament which makes you parliamentary obsessed. And that's strong for the team. It's bad in terms of it's bad in terms of two things, your ability to direct civil servants and your ability to hear from civil servants. So that is really and that, that is at it's at the extreme in defense where we always said that we had the Australian government had an embassy in the Australian Department of Defense. Um, defense just run themselves. Uh, is there a, is there a better better thing? Yes, there is, but it's not a stronger prime minister's department. Um, okay, so we'll is, vote against a stronger Prime Minister's Department. Is anyone who thinks that this is the answer? Mark, do you look on that and think actually Labour should have, you know, if I got in when I was working with you know, <laughs> Edmund Band or whatever, I would have copied that? No, I mean, I think John's put his finger on it very firmly, which is that it's the political control that the, um, the the Prime Minister has that matters you know, more than anything in the Australian system. And that political control is in part a function uh, of parliamentary um, you know, rule uh, of the kind that John has described. And it's also in part you know, the function of the fact uh, that the ecosystem, as I've described it before, is just not so interested in the multiplicity of policy and ideological debates that you find in, our, in, in, the, in the British system. I mean, just to put it very bluntly, um, you know, when I was working for Ed Miliband, you know, you'd, I'd sit, I spent hours, and John was there for some of those hours. Uh, he spent hours sort of sitting around thinking about every tiny faction of the Labour Party, which needed to be aligned to some particular kind of intervention that you were planning to make. Um, and only then would you go on to think about the country as a whole, or, or to be thinking about the intellectual advice which were coming from think tanks. Uh, and you see, you're, you're in the middle of this extraordinarily complex and difficult system, and it takes an, a politician of great strength uh, 
uh, and great vision to be able to bring order to that British chaos. An institutional uh, sort of solution of the kind of a prime minister's department just isn't going to change that. You know, a Labour leader will be constantly thinking about what do Unite think and what do the constituency parties think? What does the Corbynite left think? What does the remaining Blairite right think? Those debates just don't happen to anything like that extent, at least at the moment, in conventional Australian politics. Um, the other thing I'd just like to put on the table, though, then, because I think Laura said something extremely important, um, which is that when you are looking as a politician for external advice here in Australia at the moment, it is remarkable the power that the commercial organisations have. You know, your KPMGs, your Deloitte's, uh, your McKinsey's are where day-to-day -day policy making is outsourced to in, in Australia, um, and that could sound quite exciting. You know fizzing with innovation and creativity and private energy, but it isn't <laughs> because most of the people who are doing that, that, that work are party appointees who've come through a revolving door from a job in the state parliament or a job previously for one of the political parties, uh, and they're getting the role precisely because they are meant to come back with the policy advice, which is in line with the polling the drumbeat of which is what is driving this whole machine. Um, and nowhere is that clearer, again, as Laura said, than COVID. I cannot tell you, for all the Brits listening, it is chaos here at the moment. Right? Not only is there, you know, uh, you know, the current outbreak in Sydney, the tiny level of vaccination, there is no plan about how to open the border at any point in the future, advocated by any political party. Um, and nobody cares because news poll is out today. 73% of Australians want to keep the border closed for at least another 12 months. Uh, and that's what rules Australian politics. You know, the, the drumbeat of opinion polling is everything. If, if I could Laura, just come in. Yeah, I was just going to say, and I, I think the other thing that's happened, I mean, all the stuff about factions is true, but uh, what has also happened is that the, the race has narrowed so much. Uh, I mean, a couple of months ago, I, I think this may actually change, but a couple of months ago, we were looking at what seats would need were likely to change hand at the next election. And it was basically three or four. Uh, and this is reflected in the parliament where we have either minority governments or governments with you know a very slender majority. Uh, and that changes the internal dynamics that we're talking about in terms of the Prime Minister's control. If you've got a, a, a really decent majority, you've got much more capacity to run things and to stare down your caucus than if uh, if it's on a knife edge. And so at the moment, for example, we see the nationals, the, the, small, the smaller of the coalition uh, parties by a long shot, basically wagging the coalition tail um, and uh, forcing it into positions which most of the MPs in the government don't actually agree with but and net zero 2050 is uh, is is a classic one uh, you know all the sort of uh, uh, coal love all of those things this is a, the nationals who used to be the party of, uh, of the bush of, of the farmers uh, has now become the party of the miners and it is basically controlling the coalition agenda. That's, that's really interesting. Got a question here from Tanya Smith um, from NAUS, who's asking about, she's mentioning, and I was just reading about this in the Mandarin, um, saying the public service at federal level has been told to focus on implementation rather than big picture reform thinking. Government keeps on appointing military and ex-military people to key roles. Don't know if that's something we're likely to be uh, going, but I know there's a lot of thought during the pandemic that things only started working when you brought in some people from the army or the SAS. I think it was a Dominic Cummings comment. And she's suggesting that the big policy shops struggling to pivot to working on delivery trends, basically being taken up with focusing on digital transformation. Yeah. Oh, James, does that have any resonances in the UK that basically you don't want your department to do that much policy thinking. You really, really want it to just become a sort of delivery shop. And that's really what ministers are looking for in their departments. And maybe if you could bring in some military, you'd quite like to do that. I don't know whether there's any echoes of that in Priti Patel's thinking in the Home Office. I mean, I, I think when we're talking, I talk about what the public like to see. I think, where, what, I mean, any of us with, with the experience of government probably know that in any kind of crisis, if certainly if you polled but the public if we're just talking about that and said yeah we're just going to bring the military and people would be like yeah they'll probably probably will sort it out i'm not, not sure it's the case 
But I think that's if you're just going to go for public opinion. I mean, I was when I was listening to the discussion about bringing in of consultants and the nature of advisors, I was reflecting on my own time in government and I felt a bit like Mark talked about this earlier. I felt there's a lot of ideas around. Uh, there's a lot of great think tanks in London, different think tanks. There's yourselves, there's people from all sides of the spectrum. You know, Treasury actually look at people from different sides of the spectrum even now. Whoever's in there tends to look for ideas. The area where I saw these kinds of consultants be of maximum use was in DEFRA during no deal planning. And we had some people in and it was on delivery. And I think there is, um, I, I, I would share some of the worries. I haven't seen the detail in Australia, but I would share some of Laura's worries about that kind of entanglement around actually developing policy. And I really think it's great that we've got this, you know, neutral civil service that's able to do that. And we've got this ecosystem of think tanks um, and, and as some other people have said, there's really good policy advisors even now in the Labour Party who are in opposition and have been there for a while. I found the most useful element of bringing external people in was, you know, we're on track to have, <clears throat> you know, border systems that we were worried about as we headed towards a potential no deal. It was, I, I wanted a second opinion to come in and tell me and Michael, like, is this actually on track? Is it where people say it is? If it's not, what are the things that we need to do? That. I saw massive use for a lot of the other uses of consult consultants. I question whether it was a wise spending of taxpayers' money. To be perfectly honest, that's really interesting. I want to come on to a question we got from Mark Benister from the University of Lincoln, which is something that's very intriguing to me. Um, uh, he's pointed out that um, well, he's pointed out we seem to have caught the Australian Prime Ministerial spill condition. I think only a mild case of that having tried to explain to Australian audiences uh, for three years why Theresa May was still in power. But anyway, uh, she was supposed to get her Brexit deal through. But he says, does, however, the absence of broad party manifestos in Australia limit the level of accountability? Or actually, as we're seeing with the debates now about triple lock and things like that, does it actually give Australian governments a welcome degree of flexibility? Um, don't know who'd like to, Mark, do you have a feeling about lack of manifestos? Is that a good feature of the Australian system? Well, I, I, when, when I, they don't have manifestos. Yeah, well, when I arrived here, it was almost the opposite, if I'm, if I'm honest, which is that Bill Shorten went into the last election with an extraordinarily detailed list of policy commitments, um, which, you know, had been developed, I think, actually, from some pretty impressive policy work that the Labour Party had managed to do in opposition. Uh, you know, lots of quite deep stakeholder engagement, as we would call it, and international learnings. Uh, and it was a serious programme of reform. And the, one of the reasons to, uh, to enunciate it was precisely so that you could do it and be held to account if you didn't, so that you didn't just sort of give up everything on day one. Um, when Shorten lost that election, you know, automatically the response was, well, it must have been because he had so many policy commitments <laughs> that each one of them could have been picked off in an election campaign, uh, many of which were. Uh, and therefore, the commitment in future is to go into the election with as few, you know, a few policies as you can possibly muster. Now, you know, when I first arrived here to run a policy lab, a think tank, that was pretty terrifying, if I'm honest, because, you know, everybody was saying, like, the last thing we need to do is to have policy. You know, we've tried that once and it failed abysmally, so let's not do that again. Um, so, you know, we now are in this situation where both parties will go into the next election with a relatively thin list of policies. But my own view is that that's not, um, you know, necessarily feature of the system, it's just a current reaction to the failure of the, you know, the surprising failure of the Labour Party last time around. And uh, I think the associated with that was everybody thought that Bill Shorten was going to win, uh, including the coalition, so they didn't actually have any policies at all. Uh, so we've had three years of a government that didn't have any policies and did it matter? Well, no, but it well, yes and no, I suppose, um, if the policies, uh, if, if it had bad policies, particularly bad policies, it would have been really bad. If it had good policies, it would have been good. Uh, but um, I think we, having sort of got to that point, uh, we have sort of now in this completely more or less policy free zone where both sides of politics are actually sort of stopped from having policies because um, they've sort of made themselves so inoffensive that for either side to move now, it's just become so high risk. Uh, I mean, I, I call our current stage of politics followership rather than leadership because it is so poll driven. You know, it is about waiting to just sort of sneak through stuff that people won't be upset about. There is not 
on either side much of an idea. If I, if I could just make some a point about the whole rise of the, you know, getting the army in. Um, I think just if you're interested in the governance and uh, public service issues, one of them is that's come out with uh, COVID is that it's really illustrated that basically at the federal government level, there is actually no physical infrastructure to do stuff as, as government. You know, it doesn't have a quarantine service, those sorts of things. So they've had to rely on the military to, to run those things for them. Uh, but of course, I think my argument has long been that you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was the economists who were sort of at the centre of the ideas uh, uh, sort of patch. Uh, since 9-11, it's been national security people, and that sort of keeps just reinforcing itself in the way they sort of permeate every other aspect of our political life. Laura, I know you've got to go and dead at one, but I just wanted to ask you a question about the other bit of the Antipodes, which is New Zealand. Um, you've said followership. Over here, Jacinda Ardern was certainly perceived to be having a really good crisis. She won this majority even in this New Zealand's MMP system in the elections. You know, does Australia look to New Zealand? Should we be looking to New Zealand as the place that really is getting things a bit righter than maybe the other rest of the Anglosphere? Uh, look, I think, you know, it, you know, we're talking tonight about the UK and Australia and what we can learn from each other. To me, it's astonishing that we don't learn more across the Tasman between Australia and New Zealand, given all our similarities. Uh, look, I think uh, I wrote, wrote a, an essay about this last year um, and argued that there was a lot of stuff that New Zealand did in the 80s and 90s that we should have learned from it, as in, you know, it was good we didn't do them. Um, Jacinda Ardern now, I think there is a lot we can learn, uh, which goes to a transparency and accountability in particular. Um, she's still a very cautious politician, but uh, she has benefited from you know, the fact that it is a very unit unitary sort of system in, in uh, politics. But I think there are lessons to be learned. Um, but for us, it's mainly about those points about going back to the old ideas of trying to tell of telling people what you're doing, persuading them it's the right thing to do and that you've thought about it and this is why you're going to do it. New Zealand releases all its policy papers and documents and everything about COVID uh, voluntarily and it has done since the beginning of the crisis. Sorry about the cat. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think there's a lot of that sort of thing that we can learn from. I'm going to let you go, Laura, and go back to our uh... Uh, our sort of labour aligned uh, commentators. John, uh, then Mark, um, should Keir Starmer be looking to Jacinda Ardern? And if you were looking at Jacinda Ardern, what might you be saying? The Conservatives have done quite well, picking on Australia style, go Kiwi style. Does that have any attractions, John? Lesson of Jacinda Ardern is choose a really bad opposition. Um, <laughs> you can smash them. Um, and that is the best advice in politics. Make sure your opposition are useless. Um, Jacinda, I wouldn't copy her, partly because you can't transfer those kinds of leadership because um, her transformation in New Zealand is very much of the moment when she took the party to power uh, and of her personality. Um, she has not managed to transcend the fundamental challenge in the New Zealand economy, which is solving the housing crisis. In fact, she has, she, her majority at the last election conceals the fact that she utterly failed to deliver on her housing promise. So this question of delivery is a fundamental one. I think um, I would say one of my single transferable comments on all government is we have enough policy people, we never have enough operations people. Um, and it's partly because advisors to government are, are, are policy people. So policy people see policy solutions. Um, the reason why people reach for the army is that they're the only senior people that we know in government who actually do operations. Of course, DWP do operations too, and so do local government, but they're less respected. Um, what I would say to, to Keir is, yeah, is, is you have to look at any politician who is fighting against uh, an entrenched government and see take elements of the approaches of individual people. So Jacinda overturned uh, a long term, a long period of, uh, of of Tory government. It looks likely Albo in Australia is going to do the same. Um, but you have to you have to basically take this from here, that from there, that from there. You know, we potentially have enough more to learn from 
Portugal with a successful sister party in power for quite a long time, or Spain with a successful coalition created, uh, than we do we do from Australia. The, 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 the laziness of UK politics resides in because we can speak English and read English, we think that English speaking countries have the greatest lessons to give to us. Uh, when if we, I think the thing for Kia is learn more languages or have advisors with more languages so you can learn from more settings. Okay, I'm going to go to Mark. Mark, anything you'd learn from New Zealand? Are you intrigued by New Zealand to sit in the Sydney Policy Lab? Yeah, I'm well, very much intrigued by New Zealand for on the policy front, where there is fantastic creativity, especially in social service delivery. On the politics side, I think the thing that Kia can learn from Jacinta Ardern is that she has managed to hold together a remarkable reputation for progressiveness whilst being an astonishingly moderate Labour leader. Uh, and that's a really important challenge for Kia because that's exactly what he needs to do. He needs to keep enough of the Miliband Corbyn coalition excited and engaged at the same time as tacking to the centre in some important policy debates. Uh, Ardern's managed to do that remarkably well, probably through the force of personality and charisma that Kia wouldn't be able to copy, but it would be intriguing nonetheless to see what strategic foresight went into that work. Thank you. Jacinda Ardern is clearly the Gareth Southgate of uh, <laughs> hemisphere politics. She says, my only football reference today. James, final word. John was saying, actually, don't look, uh, don't confine yourself to looking at these questions, these countries that speak English. Do you look actually in the Conservative Party at any other country, dare I say it, even some European countries at some of the sort of policies you might want to adopt or do you just regard this as a sort of private club with other people who happen to write in English? I mean this well we, we go back to different areas I think I was reading a really interesting piece in The Economist a couple of weeks ago and it's just about the nature of world economy and where 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 Europe is probably behind and they, the kind of two countries cited as ahead in different way but in very different ways are China and the US so and I think if you talk about education tech sector and how, and how you kind of move your economy forward. I think, I don't know if it's a Tory thing, I feel like a lot of people, there's a lot of things we wouldn't want to take from China, for sure, uh, not least their human rights record. But I think in terms of how they have promoted parts of their economy, how they've changed their education system, and that's something that we haven't quite touched on today, but that I think is a huge issue for this country going forward is, is, is kind of how we gear our education system to support the kind of economy and the kind of jobs we want in the future. And I think that's something that you can look to a host of those kind of Far Eastern countries, but particularly China, perhaps. So Shanghai on Thames rather than Singapore on Thames. <laughs> that's it. Anyway. I think that's going to be the end of our world tour, I'm afraid, because it's 102. Could I just thank our fantastic panellists, Laura, who had to go, Mark in Sydney, John in uh, London and James. And thank you all. Remember, you can all re-watch this uh, when you do. And could I finally just thank Nouse very much for their sponsorship of this event. Thank you.